So good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, I hope you had a meaningful Rosh Hashanah, and I hope it was you were able to make something of it. And you know, yeah, I think there's some beautiful elements to it, but hopefully we don't have to kind of repeat such a thing again. Tonight, I want to talk about Yom Kippur, specifically Musaf, a little bit of Mincha, not really, and we'll talk about Neila, and we'll, we'll hopefully touch on Mincha. I'll explain why we're not going to do it tonight. Uh, if you missed l last week, I spoke about Shacharit, um, Mariv and Shacharit, and a bit of the Torah reading. And right, so this week we'll move forward, but you can, if you need the recording from last week, just let me know. So without further ado, obviously it would be helpful to have a Mahzor on hand, um, but I will be using some sources. That's a good, good deal. Okay, um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. So I do have a nice piece by Rav Cook here that maybe we can come back to uh, in the end. In the end, but obviously the Musaf on Yom Kippur looks—it's it, structured very much like the Musaf of any other um, regular Musaf, except it has—and this is in terms of what we would personally say—it has the the elements that are unique to Yom Kippur, and then it finishes off with the, with the Vidui, which we did speak about before and we'll touch upon later on this evening. Uh, but Musaf kind of looks, in the beginning, in terms of the Musaf, the, you know, the, just the personal Amida looks pretty similar to anything that we've seen as of yet. But obviously, it's in the Chazan's repetition where it becomes, where it begins to uh, move away quite dramatically and, and you know, the, the repetition of the chazan is quite significant. With that being said, a person should say the the repetition on um, on Yom Kippur, but not like you know they wouldn't say the Baruch Atah Hashem and they wouldn't say um, you know the this. I mean, like if we I'll, actually I'll get into that in a moment. I'll talk about the more technical stuff in just a moment. But first, I want to just kind of present. Uh, an idea which I have spoken about before, but I think it's one we just have to keep on reminding ourselves about, especially as we approach the Avodah of Yom Kippur, especially as we talk about what the Kohen, uh, sorry, what the Shaliach Tzibor says on Yom Kippur. This point is uh, in, you know, obviously very, very important. There is a a discussion, which I'm not going to go into, into great detail, in Masechet Yoma, if you look here in front, in Masechet Yoma, it discusses the way in which the Kohen Gadol would make his way towards the uh, Kodesh HaKodeshim on Yom Kippur. And there's uh, an argument between uh, Rabbi Yossi and, um, and I think, Rabbi Meir. So, as to which direction he takes, did he go, you know, north south, or did he go east west? Right? The technicalities of that are, are, I'm sure, are of essential importance, but not for us at this moment. Then, in, after a, a complicated discussion as to, you know, who, who does Rabbi Mayer specifically hold like, they then have this, they make this mention that Rabbi Yossi says that basically the Kohen Gadol does not, you know, there's a suggestion that the Kohen Gadol had to kind of take a circuitous route in order to get to the Holy of Holies. He had to kind of go around stuff and make his way around stuff. But Rabbi Yossi, in the end, he basically says the following thing, that the Kohen Gadol could go straight to the, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, straight to the Holy of Holies, because, as it says right, uh, right here, Amar Lecha, Chavivin Yisrael, the Jewish people are beloved to, to God. The Torah did not require them to make use of an agent, of an agent to intercede on their behalf. The Jewish people don't need an, an angel 
we don't have to pray to angels to then take our prayers to God. Uh, by the way, you know, there's one of one of my favorite songs in the Slichot service is, of course, Machnise Rachamim, right? Is, that, or is it uh, Mordechai ben David or Avram Fried? One of them, you know, made it very popular, beautiful song. But a lot of people don't say it. I skip over when I actually say it. Rav, Rav Soloveitchik said that a person should skip it, Machnise Rachamim, which talks about we basically are appealing to the angels to carry our prayers to God. And, and though the melody is incredible, but we don't need to appeal to the angels in order to take our prayers up to Hashem. And that's what this Gemara is, here is saying. And that's really what, what we want to kind of just nail down, this idea that just like the Kohen Gadol, could kind of walk into the Holy of Holies. And he didn't need to take a circuitous route. And he didn't, you know, he didn't need an angel. He had an audience with God. So too, in truth, it doesn't say Chavivin Kohanim, that the, that the Kohanim are so beloved to God. Sorry, Al. Right? It doesn't say that the Kohanim are so beloved. It says the Jewish people are so. That means you and me, regardless of whether or not we are a Kohen or a Kohen Gadol. We are all beloved, and therefore we have a direct audience with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a direct audience with God. And yes, we are normally used to having someone who maybe to an extent, maybe is a bit more proficient in prayer, uh, or at least has maybe a nicer voice than us to stand up there and to pray and to lead the community. We're used to that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily need it. We'll miss a lot. There's no question. Yom Kippur will, will it'll be a poor man's version this year. Uh, but, but it's an opportunity and we still have to, we'll have to work hard to find that connection. And I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know if you guys, what your experiences were like over Rosh Hashanah, if you were able to have some moments of, of connection. I struggled, I have to say, I, you know, like I really needed, need that ability also to be able to lead and to, to sing, and that's my own Mishigas. Uh, but it, it, there was challenges for me, and I, I know that I've got to really invest a lot more into Yom Kippur to make it as special and as powerful. Uh, and, but we have to remind ourselves that we are beloved and that we have an audience with God, especially on Yom Kippur. Okay, now, before I move on, I just want to take a moment. Is, is there any, any questions that people specifically want addressed? Any, any things that are on your mind? Any questions you had coming out of Rosh Hashanah, things that were confusing? Okay. Just a little bit about Yisko, like when's the time, right time? Or... Yeah, so in, in that... we'll, we'll talk about Yisko in a little bit, but in terms of Yisko, just, just for... Uh, time being, uh, I mean, Yisker will be, is put basically at the regular time that it is put. Um, so you would do it after the Torah reading. So last week we spoke about the Torah reading, and I think people should sit down with the Torah. Uh, obviously, you don't, won't have a Torah, but even, you know, you look inside the book and, you know, you read the, the in English, or you can read in Hebrew, whatever, whatever works for you. Then there's a Haftorah. And then after that, then there is... Um, you know, uh, I took the wrong one. I got Rosh Hashanah here. Um, I'll give me a moment. Uh, you know, after the Torah reading, then there, of course, is the rabbi's drasha. So expect me at about 1030, depending upon, you know, I'll be staggered. Um, there's the rabbi's drasha, and then there's Yisker at that moment. Um, so, you know, we will we will be doing when exactly... I still have to determine at some point on Sunday on Erev Yom Kippur, we'll be doing kind of like a virtual gathering to do Yisker, uh, to just to be able to, uh, to kind of do that together and have that element. With that being said, uh, you should do it and say the prayers that you normally would say. You can say them in English uh, at just at that time after the Torah reading before the Musaf. Does that make sense? Just give me a moment. Somebody just texted me about the shiur tonight, so just give me a moment. Okay, um, I'm just going to grab my master and I'll be right back.
So let's keep rolling here. All right. Um, now, so with uh, with that being said, so you know we've done we've done Yizker, and then we move on towards. Um, Hold on, something weird's happening because people said that, which link did you guys use to go in? Did I send a different link? There's a whole, it says, we're all waiting for you. I don't know where they're waiting for me. It was in the email yes, uh, that you sent yesterday that was the link I used. Yeah, that's what I thought. Me too, also yesterday's letter, email. Did it have, uh, did I? Did I send a different one last week? And the WhatsApp group that I sent out today. Yes, yeah. I, I, I used the WhatsApp group today. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I used the WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Hold on. Uh, one second. Let me just sort this out. I don't know. Cause we're all Give me a moment. Sorry, guys. Okay. So... For those people who uh, came in so rudely late, um, what we were talking about before was how the, in essence, we have, we can feel empowered to recognize that Hashem, we are beloved to Hashem. We don't need an intermediary. We don't need an angel to speak on behalf of. We don't need a, uh, you know, we don't even really need the Kohen Gadol we can, each of us in our own homes, and this is a theme that we've been talking about a lot, each of us in our own homes, we have the capacity to connect to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It'll take work, but we're able to do such a thing. Um, now, after we've, so we've, we've laid the Torah, we've said Yizker on our own. We've said Yizker. And now we're getting ready for Musaf. Usually, when a person gets ready for Musaf, hi John, sorry about that. That was a bit of a confusion. Karen, it's good to see you. Um, there was a bit of a, uh, normally, there's a little section that this is where the, 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 the Chazan begins to prepare himself. And most people take a moment or they run to the bathroom or whatever it is, or they sit, or they meditate. And it's a time for the chazan to kind of just really prepare himself to, to think about what it is that he's about to do. And I don't know if you normally read it, um, but maybe now is a good time for you to read that before you sit down and you're not the shaliach tzibor necessarily on behalf of the community, but you're now you're on behalf of yourself and you have to rec you know, take that on a bit more. And so say the hinani tefillah, and it's a beautiful tefillah, it's powerful. Um, you know, behold, I stand here impoverished in good deeds, perturbed and frightened in fear of him who is enthroned upon the praises of Israel. I've come to stand and to plead before you on behalf of your people, Israel, who have appointed me their messenger, even though I'm not worthy or qualified for the task. And this is, I think, something that, uh, you know, Ba'alei Tefillah need to internalize and to recognize this and uh, it's a big responsibility to pray on behalf of others, but all of us now to recognize, you know, on our own in terms of our deeds, I don't know about you. I don't know if I could look at myself and say, like, in terms of all the stuff that I've been given, have I lived up to all the potential that God has blessed me with? So on my own deeds, like, am I really worthy? I don't know. I don't know if I can say that I'm actually worthy to stand before God and to pray, uh, certainly not on behalf of the community. Sorry to break it to you guys, but not even after myself. So rather, I beseech you, God, of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Hashem, and then we start to, you know, go into the Yud Gimel Midot of Rachim, Hashem, Hashem, the Almighty, the Compassion, Gracious, the, the God of Israel, Sh Shakai, the Eminent and the Awesome, Help me succeed in the mission which I have taken, which I have undertaken. So I, I urge you to use this as an opportunity to reach out to Hashem and to say, okay, I'm about to do something. I've never done this before in a sense of daven on my, you know, with myself or just with my family, Yom Kippur. 
Uh, maybe you have, I don't know, maybe you've been in situations before you haven't had been with a minion, but it's been a long time for most of us. And take a moment to just kind of prepare yourself and get focused. Uh, and so, you know, you can say, say this whole tefillah, even though it's not 100% applicable, but you certainly can say the whole tefillah. Okay. Now I want to point out that I brought here, we mentioned um, Thursday night, then who was it? It was uh, Philip Nagley. He mentioned how he learned about Yishai Rebo and he, you know, he came across Yishai Rebo, which is fantastic. And we mentioned that Yishai Rebo had this, has this um, melody that he wrote for the Avodah of the Kohen Gadol. And it's, I think it's a beautiful melody and he changes it. He shifts up kind of the focus of the Avodah. I have here, you can, you know, this is Safaria, which is the, the website that we're using right now. It's a really great resource. So their educators have put together in this little sheet here, if anybody's interested, I can send it to you. But they've put together kind of like a little bit of a, um, uh, like an assignment, if you will that you can listen to the song and then answer questions and, and kind of understand the avodah, the temple service a little bit better, but also have maybe a different insight based upon Yishai Rebo's melody. So that's this, this text here, if anybody wants that. So you, Safari is also the, the song is embedded within the source sheet. So that's a, something if somebody has time over the next few days and they wanna you know, do something a little bit different. So that's a beautiful, um, a beautiful experience that I think is, is worthwhile. Just going to look to see if we've got uh, Gardner, is he here? Sorry, we missed you, Paul and, and Helen. There was a bit of uh, crossed wires, unfortunately, but we're all here, and Elizabeth, good to see you. Okay, so here we are, all good. Let's, let's jump into it. We've got a lot to do here. The, I, I brought before, uh, I think it was when we were in, yes, in discussion of the nature of blowing the shofar in Rosh Hashanah, there was a, um, a, what's the word I'm looking for? There, there was a discussion in Masechet Rosh Hashanah about what shofar a person can use. And we spoke about how a person is not supposed to use the shofar of a cow. Why can't we use the shofar of a cow? So the, the Gemara says this should be review for most of you because you have learned this, I think we learned this two weeks ago. This is the reasoning of the rabbis who say that the horn of a cow is unfit for standing or shoshana. They say this is in accordance with the opinion of Rav Chista. As Rav Chista said, for what reason does a high priest not enter the innermost sanctum, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, with his golden garments to perform the service there in Yom Kippur? It is because a prosecutor cannot become an advocate. So this gold that the, that the Kohen Gadol wears, the gold is a reminder of the, uh, the golden calf. And so the Kohen Gadol, he steps in to be praying on behalf of the Jewish people, he can't carry gold with him, the very thing, because it's his clothing that helped him lift him up and inspire him to the right space. So like the gold cannot be the thing that brings about the, um, you know, to be, to advocate on behalf of the Jewish people. So we see here, and this, the, the, what we spoke about in Rosh Hashanah is this beautiful idea of how the shofar, it's like being in the, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, which is a beautiful idea. But what already what we start to see from this Gemara here is that, well, the question is, what is the Kohen Gadol doing? What is the Kohen, and if we can understand this, it'll help us understand what we're trying to do. What is the Kohen Gadol trying to experience in that moment? In that moment of stepping into the Kodesh HaKodeshim and doing the work on Yom Kippur, what is he trying to do? So, if we had more time, I would open, the, open it up, uh, but I, I do need to kind of move through this. I want to suggest, and this is based on something that I, that I learned myself, that when the Kohen Gadol steps into the Kodesh HaKodeshim on Yom Kippur, he is recreating that moment where HaKodesh Baruch Hu forgave the Jewish people after the sin of the golden calf. 
which of course is tied up with Yom Kippur, right? The, the forgiveness that we received is the forgiveness is historically, biblically, the forgiveness that we received uh, as a result of the sin of the golden calf. And so it's this space, the, the Kohen Gadol steps into the space of the Kodesh HaKodeshim, which is in essence a recreation of Moshe stepping into the Ohel Moed, stepping into the holy, into that, the tent of meeting. So just read very briefly. It says, now Moshe would take the tent, and this is just after the sin of the golden calf. He would take the tent and pitch it outside the camp at some distance from the camp. It was called the tent of meeting. Whoever sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. Whenever Moshe went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moshe until he had entered the tent. And when Moshe entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would ascend and stand at the entrance of the tent while he spoke with Moshe. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud poised at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise and, and bow low, each at the entrance to his, of his tent. The Lord would speak to Moshe face to face as one man speaks to another, and he would then return to the camp. But his intendant, Yeshua ben Nun, a youth, would not stir. Moshe said to God, See, you say to me, lead this people for, but you have not made known to me for whom you will send with me, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but the Moshe turns to God and basically beseeches Hashem. He says, Hashem, let me see your presence. Hashem, let me know who you are. Let me understand you deeply. And then God reveals himself in a deep way and says, I have forgiven the Jewish people. And so it is when the, Kohen, when the Kohen Gadol steps back into the Holy of Holies, he's recreating that moment of intimacy, of, of appealing to God on behalf of the Jewish people. And this has to be our mindset as well. So this is a little bit, um, I think I've, I might have gotten a bit ahead of myself because I think you know, people want to understand as well you know, how we're going to do this. But in essence, we daven musaf like we normally would. So I'll just take, I'll just show you inside what we do. If you've got your mach story, you can take a look. So in the art scroll, I don't know who's got it on the Quran, but the art scroll is page 486. So then you've just said the hinani prayer. On 486, you just begin as you normally would with the additions for Yom Kippur. Uh, then it, it starts to move into the normal structure of the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Musaf. So, you know, at, right after the first few blessings, then we go into that section of Bechein, Tain, Pachtecha, three times of Bechein, Tain, uh, which we spoke about the first time we met about the significance of that structure. And then we say, Baruch HaTashem, HaMelech HaKadosh. Then we go into the section of Kedushat Hayom, the sanctity of the day. We talk about how God chose, how God chose us and God gave us all of these korbanot. But because of our sins, we've been kicked out of the land. Had we had the Beit HaMikdash, we would have offered the following thing. And that is the same structure that we would do on a Musaf of Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, a Musaf of Rosh Chodesh. Because of our sins, we were kicked out of the land. But if we were in the land, this is what we would offer. Then we, we talk about the offering of the day and we beseech God to basically, and that's on 490 at the bottom, we beseech God to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, to forgive us and to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash uh, and to, you know, to bring us to that place, you know, and all the blessings, etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. And we finish off with blessing God, Melech Mochel, the Soleach on page 492. Obviously, in each of these things, we can go into more detail, but this is pretty self-explanatory. And then we finish off uh, the Musaf as we normally would. And then we would go into the Vidui on page 494. We've spoken about the Vidui already. We'll come back to it when we get back to Neila in a moment. And we say the Vidui as we do, and we have finished the Musaf Amida. okay? But now we're faced with the Chazan's repetition. So as I mentioned before, we don't say the, the Chazarat, we don't say Baruch HaTah Hashem, right? We don't say the first three blessings of the repetition. We also don't have to say all of the very small, you know, there's all those little small sections 
um, you know, you know, obviously when, and this is what I said last week, whenever it says some congregations skip this, we skip it. We would have skipped it at Blake Street, but we certainly can skip it at home as well. And feel free to, to say whatever it is that you want to say. In a sense, there are all of these sukim. You can do the whole thing without, you know, again, we don't do the first few blessings and we don't do the kedusha, but do the rest of it if you want or don't, right? That's kind of up to you. Uh, there's there then, of course, within the Musaf of the Chazan, so I'll, I'll show you where I am in a moment. I mean, there's all of these, you know, famous and important uh, PU team, like on page 522, for example, of Imru Lelokim. So you can switch to 522. Andrew, sorry, I don't have the, the Koran numbers in front of me. But if you look to, the, you know, page 522, Imru Lelokim, you want to say it? Great. You don't want to say it? That's okay as well. Um, and then same thing with Masa Elokeno in 524. It, it, it depends on your uh, patience or your nostalgic, um, you know, feeling in, in the moment. If, you're feel, if you want to do it, great, okay? Then we get to 530, which is Unatana Tokef. You should say Unatana Tokef. You certainly should sing it to yourself if you've got a tune. If you don't, again, there are plenty on, uh, online that you can find. Um, I sent out that resource of tefillah.com.au. That's a tune, uh, but there are other more traditional tunes of, Chaz of Chazanut. Definitely highly recommend that you say Unatana Tokef however you want to say in a time of Tokef. Page 534, it's Ain Kitzva, one of my favorite tunes. You can sing it or sing it at the meal later on on Yom Kippur, uh, like I did on Rosh Hashanah. I, I sing it at the meal. You can do it on Yom Kippur as well. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> Tough crowd. Um, okay, then we go to 538. Again, Chamol. Sing Chamol if you want to. Beautiful. Right. Yes, Elizabeth, you have a question. Yes, please. Um, with when you in shul and the ark is open and you're saying this, some of these prayers, you obviously stand. Yeah. But at home, there's no ark that's open. Uh, do we still have to stand, or can we? Sit you can sit. I would stand, but one could yeah. sit in theory because there's no, like you said, there's no ark that's open. Uh, but I think a person, I would stand for them. But if a person felt like they didn't want to, then they, you know, depends on how you're feeling, I'd say. Um, right, so the same thing, yes, there's all these things with the arc is opened. If you don't have an arc, uh, then, then you don't necessarily need to stand, but I think it would probably be best for a person to also for your own sake, you know what I mean? Like, it feels something different. You're getting up and doing that kind of experience of making it more experiential as opposed to just kind of sitting on the couch, but it depends on how you feel. Okay, so the structure here so far is pretty similar, you know, once we're in these parts, it's pretty similar to, Yom, to Rosh Hashanah as well, the, the, the nature of the prayers, um, you know, then one more, I'm, I, I'm now on 544, so we see, then they say again, of attain, tain, pachtacha, right, you don't need to say that again, because you've already said it uh, just a moment ago. So to 546, it continues with the Kedushat Hayom. It continues to talk about the, the sacrifices. And then we start on page 550. We say Aleinu. One could say, but you don't necessarily need to. Already in 552, this is where we begin to shift. We start to, so that even the Chazen, Norman the Chazen for Musaf and Lawrence Cantelia as well. That's when you start to, okay, now we've, moved that first kind of section out of the way, and now we're getting into it. Uh, and so that's 552. The Chazan kind of begins his, his beseeching. And that beseeching concludes with Ochila uh, Lakel, which again, one could sing out loud if they want to. Um, uh, you know, even though, yes, it is really about the Chazan, but one certainly can, especially if there's a melody that you like. From 554 on, this is where most people in shul normally tune out. But this is where this year you need to pay attention because you're the one doing it, right? And so what I recommend, though, is because you've got the time. So normally it's kind of like you've just been davening for a while. There's a whole bunch of vidui. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening. 
But now you're in a situation where you're the only, you're doing it at home. So take your time and sit down and read the English. Forget about the Hebrew. I'm serious. Forget about the Hebrew in this situation. Read the English and it basically talks about the, um, you know, so the first section is pretty uh, poetic. This where, where it says Amit's Koach is quite poetic, but it starts to describe and, it, and then it becomes a bit more narrative. It describes the Avoda of the Kohen Gadol. Right? It describes all the different details that the Kohen Gadol would do. And so, again, what I recommend is, you know, you certainly could say it in Hebrew if you like that, but also just read it in English and see what's, go what's, what's happening. Um, and do that all the way up until 560. And 560, things already start to change. So, again, what we've done here, and I'll talk about 560 on in just a moment, what we've done here is we've kind of Right, we've been saying everything that we want to say, but now from whatever it was, 544, uh, sorry, 546, no, 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 554, <laughs> we've started the Avoda, we've started this kind of new section, which, like I said, I recommend everybody sit down and say and do and, and spend, you know, spend their time looking at the text on the bottom, because this is the main part. This is really what the whole day is all about. Before I start to get into a little bit, does anybody have any questions at this time? Okay. All right. So as I mentioned before, the this avoda is quite an elaborate. When we, when we say again, just to be very clear, the avoda is the service of the Kohen Gadol, right? We're talking about the temple service and the avoda is a, an, an incredibly elaborate thing. And I certainly cannot in this evening uh, discuss all the details, but you've got a great resource. The, the, the Mahsar is a fantastic resource. It can go as deep as you want. Uh, also, I mentioned last week, if, you, if you're in your art scroll, um, Mahsor, on page, a moment here, sorry. On page 192 in the art scroll Mahsor is the Mishnayot of Masechet Yoma. All of the, 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 it's a, quite an elaborate discussion of all the laws that we're about to, to, to read in a more poetic form. So if a person wanted to, you could at night, in the, during the day, over the next few days, begin to start to go through these Mishnayot and read them in English and look at some of the Perushim, uh, and that will kind of help you, and you'll start to recognize things like, oh yeah, I remember that, right? And, and so that just kind of gives you a sense, a bit of a sense of what you're about to do and really what, what is happening here with the Kohen Gadol, because it is elaborate. The, though it is elaborate, I just want to remind us, and this will kind of help us in terms of our own uh, state of mind, that it's really about recreating that moment of intimacy when Moshe Rabbeinu was standing before God and God forgave us after that really awful, <laughs> awful sin of the golden calf, God forgave the Jewish people. And it's that that we are moving towards. And it's that as well that the Kohen Gadol was trying to achieve on his own. Okay. Now, I'll mention that there are um, many korbanot. There are many sacrifices that the, uh, the Kohen would offer up. The first thing that he would do, however, and you can... Um, the first thing he would do, if you look on page 560, if you look on page 560 in the, in the, so this is after you've just read this whole thing that Scott discusses how he would get prepared and how he would, um, you know, have to sit and learn for seven days and he would change his clothing and he would immerse, and he would do all these things. But the first thing that he would do is sacrifice a, um, a bull. It would sacrifice a bull. And in that situation, the bull is for him. 
right? And this is, if you look here, the, the verse in, in Parshat Acharemo, V'yikriv Aaron et parachatat asher lo, v'chiper ba'ado v'ad beito. So Aaron is to offer his own bull of sin offering, and the rabbis learn after uh, at parachatat asher lo, it must be his. He must pay for it on his own. It must be his own bull, right? Uh, and he then will uh, atone on his own behalf, on behalf of his family. And so what we learn here is that the Kohen, before he's going to go and try to uh, work on achieving forgiveness for everybody else, he's got to do it on, for himself. And this, of course, is a powerful lesson for all of us, you know, for thinking about it, you know, whether you are a rabbi, uh, or a teacher, or more so, probably, you know, more, more directly, you know, a parent or a grandparent, you want to influence others, you want others to do certain things, you need to be working on yourself first. And that's the Kohen has to do this for himself, he has to seek out forgiveness and work on his own stuff for himself. And that's the Kaha Hayaomer, Ana Hashem Chatati Aviti Pashati Lefanecha Ani Uveti. Right? So he seeks out forgiveness for himself in this moment. The, but he also then brings a korban for everybody else. He brings a korban for the rest of the Jewish people. And this, I want to, you know, empower us as well as we're davening on Yom Kippur to be asking for our own forgiveness. There's no question. And to be, do, you know, using the V-doing, using the, the, you know, all the different opportunities that we have for Yom Kippur to look within and to, to think about the things that we need to work on and to, to strive to do better. But we also need to pray on behalf of Am Yisrael. So there's no Kohen Gadol and there's no Shaliach Tzibor, there's us. And each of us in our own, we need to pray for forgiveness for the Jewish people and see ourselves in that role. And as you've heard many, many times, the, the structure of all of the tefillot that the Jewish people always say is almost always in the plural. We're always diving for all of us. We're not just diving for ourselves. And we need to keep that in mind and feel empowered to, to, to pray on behalf of you know, Asham nu, Bagad nu, right? We have sinned. We have become guilty. We have been, you know, and so we, we want to pray for, for forgiveness on behalf of everybody, okay? The, let's, uh, you know, this next point, I, I think every year in Yom Kippur, I point it out, but it, again, it's like the core of the experience as we will see over and over again. So the Kohen Gadol says, So once again, we're on page 560 in the art scroll, or you can look up here with me on the screen. Ana Vashem, God, with your name. I beg of you, with your name. Okay, and that's the right. So we're about to say this name. Kaperna, lachataim, v'lavonot, v'latashayim, shechatati, Okay, forgive me for all my sins and my family's sins. As is written in the Torah of Moshe. So Al is, I see Al singing there, but Al, what happened to the verse? What happened to it? What should it have said? Right, you're, you're, I can see you mouth it. Titaru, right? Before God, you shall be purified. But where did it just says Lifne Hashem, right? Anyone notice that? The verse just finished. So let's look at what happens a little bit l- later on. And you, you'll see, um, and then it says, Right, you know the, the whole thing, okay? Um, 
So the Kohanim and the people were standing in the courtyard when they heard Kishahayu Shomim, when they would hear the name, Mefarash, explicit, said from the Kohen Gadol, Bikdushav Tahara, Hayukorim Mishtachami Mimodim. Right? Everyone knows this moment, one of the, one of the best moments of all of Yom Kippur, of that lying down, right, of the, the kneeling, what we call, actually called a, a kida. that's the technical term, uh, that kind of Muslim, what we now know it as a Muslim prostration, but we've been doing it a lot, lot longer than they were, uh, so this kind of bowing down, and they would say, right, they would fall on their faces because they heard the name, so whether this is the Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey, but said, as we don't say it, right? We don't say the name as it's pronounced. We say it as we, you know, we say Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. So maybe it was that, or maybe it was some other name, but they would hear it and then they would say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed, blessed is his name, his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And then it says, Va'af Hu Hayamit Kaven Ligmar Tashem Keneged Amevarchim Ve'omer Lahem Titaru, right? And he prolonged the intoning of the name. This refers to the name of Hashem. And then he would say, Titaru. So what is going on here is, if you look, this is the verse, right? This is the verse that Al said that we repeat over and over again, right? So they would, in that moment, the Kohen Gadol would say the name as it's said, as it's written, uh, and everyone fell on their face. But what the Maxor is doing is it's actually painting the picture of what happened. So it kind of like does something and then stops. So Lifnei Hashem, he would say this name, and then everybody, you know, that Kohanim, everybody lies down, they would hear, they would fall on their faces, they would say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Vad, and then he would finish the name, spread out that name of Hashem, and then he would say, Titaru, I'm sure exactly in that melody as well. So just, I, I hope that's clear, but this, this moment is kind of this recreation of uh, that, that incredible revelation that happened, which was unique, where they heard the name of God and they fell on their faces. Our kavana in that moment as we say this, this is something I spoke about earlier, uh, last week in Yom Kippur in, our, in the, the, the kind of our preliminary thoughts and we'll hopefully touch a little bit later on this evening, but it's all about being lifnei Hashem. It's all about trying to sense as much as we can what does it mean to be before God. And as much as we can to try to conjure up that space within us and without, you know, around us of what does it mean to be sitting in front of God? The, the intimacy of that moment of Moshe standing in the Ohel Moed, of Hashem's love, great love being revealed to the Jewish people. That intimacy that was recreated when the Kohen Gadol was able to beseech God and also reveal that great love. And we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And we have that capacity and we have that potential and it's, it's difficult and it, sometimes it takes a leap of imagination, but it is within us and there's no better time than this strange Yom Kippur in this strange year to try to tap into a different level of experiencing God in that sense of intimacy and in that sense of closeness, that lifnei Hashem, that we are before God, that we are literally always at every moment before God, but on Yom Kippur, we allow ourselves to feel it in a way that purifies us and that heals us. Before I move on, I already see it's 850, man. Any questions, any comments? Y'all still with me? Yep. Mm. Hey, Roger, any... so are we, what, what are we doing for, uh, where we um, do the Hakanim? Are we, are, we, are we just sort of bowing like a normal modim bow or can we go down on the in floor? theory you could just read it but i i say do the pro do it bow man just do it do the kida do the full kida i think so you know 
you know, it's not the same sort of thing, but it's these sort of rituals that I think are, are an important aspect uh, of, the, of the experience. Yeah. So just uh, on that point, right? So there's a kida, which is that, pro, that sort of on kneeling. And then there's the hishtachava, like vanach mikor mishtachavin. That's when they used to really prostrate themselves on the floor, but we don't do that anymore. Unfortunately, that would be pretty wild. Although you can go to certain places in Israel where you always get some, some interesting characters who, who, who definitely do that, uh, but it's a bit frowned upon in our parts here. We're a bit more proper. Um, okay, cool. Any other questions before we move on? Yes, Leon. Mister, we'll be able to do it because we'll be at home. We'll have more room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a, a, a question, Rabbi. I'm sorry, I was light because I couldn't find the notice. Uh, did you mention Isker already or not yet? Yeah, yeah, we spoke about Isker. And so, I mean, I, I, what I said was um, after you do the Torah reading, so mm -hmm. after you read the Torah reading, you should do the Isker on your own. Um, the text is there and just yeah, sure. you know, read the sections. What I mentioned was that as well, that on Sunday, uh, we'll have kind of a pre-Yom Kippur gathering where we'll do some Isker as well to have a, a communal um, experience around that. But a person should certainly repeat it as well again on um, on the day. I'll send out the times tomorrow, please, Gun. That's the plan. But Thank does, you. Do, you have, do you have more specific questions about that, or is that no, no, no. is that okay? Just follow what's in the. No problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So the avoda basically continues uh, from there, and then he goes on. He prays for the. Um, He, he prays for the Jewish people. He does the sprinkling of the blood, which is quite wild. I'm not going to get into all of that right now, but the Mishnah and Masechet Yomad talks about that and all the significance of that. And again, it, it's quite significant. It's long, but, you know, invest in it as much as you can. And 570, always a beautiful, a beautiful moment. If you look in the, the uh, before M Murray Cohen, uh, before that, there's the, the Yihiratzon, this, you know, may it be your will, and we pray, and I, again, use this as an opportunity to, to pray that it should be a good year and a year of health, and um, what was it, oh, that great, um, that great line, it's always so, it's a really weird sort of thing, I'm sure there's something about it at the end here, but like, we've got this beautiful Yihiratzon, if you look on page 570 in the art scroll, a beautiful prayer for the upcoming year, and then it concludes in the following way, and concerning the inhabitants of, of the Sharon, he would say, may it be your will, Hashem, our God, and the God of our forefathers, that their homes not become their graves. I always thought that, that was kind of like a weird climax of the, of the experience. Obviously, there was kind of, you know, mud, uh, whatever, mudslides and that sort of stuff in that area. But anyway, kind of strange. Then we get up to, of course, um, for a lot of people, this is, you know, one of the highlights, Emmet Man Hadar or Murray Cohen. Um, and there's that great meme of that guy, Murray Cohen, you know, you know, an old guy smoking a cigar. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? No, no. Okay. I'll send it out maybe <laughs> before you end this. Um, so Mare Cohen, not Murray Cohen. I'm going to share my screen here. I have here, if anybody wants these sources, I'm more than happy to share it with you. The um, Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, the great thinker, the great leader, the great rabbi of the 20th century, speaks about the real importance of, the, of saying the avodan. There's a really beautiful kind of recollection of his experiences. Um, and... I want to read for you, this is something that he said in 1979 for the Rabbinical Council of America. And he was talking about his ancestors who came from the old world of Europe. And he said, they said, and this is about the, um, the avoda of the Kohen Gadol. They said it was so much enthusiasm, enthusiasm, such ecstasy that they could not stop. They were no longer in Warsaw or Brisk. They were transported to a different reality. Although I'm not a musician or a musicologist, all one had to do was hear the nigun of ha-kohanim ve'ha'am to understand. One did not, right, 
והכהנים איי, 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 איי. One did not even need to hear the words in order to feel the nostalgia for what once existed and is no longer. Similarly, the kachaya mone achas, 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 towards the end of the avoda, when the scarlet thread turned white, the pute describes the nation exuded happiness, expressing pleasure and delight, a feeling of closeness to Hashem. He is right beside me. Why the happiness in reciting Mare Kohen? Why was it sung with such a happy tune? The answer is that the Kohen Gadol reflected the radiance of the Shekhinah. Through witnessing the radiant appearance of the Kohen Gadol, there could be no doubt about Hashem's acceptance of Kalal Yisrael's prayers. Suddenly the Paitan, right, the one who wrote the Piyut, the liturgical prayer, and the reader of the Piyut are rudely awakened from a dream. They cry, this is no longer the reality in which we live. It existed once, yes, but it is no more. One finds himself alone in a stormy night, dark, lost, and yells, all this occurred while the temple was in existence. Ashreya ayin, asherata, right? Happy is the eye which saw these things, but not our eye. While reciting the avoda, the Jew is transported to a different, beautiful world. He is now rudely awakened to find himself in a bitter exile. The detail we just discussed, the kachaya monen, this is how, we, how he uh, counted, we no longer have. And so what the Rav eloquently uh, is describing is this transition. Of course, we go into the Avoda. The Avoda of Yom Kippur is beautiful. It's long. It's challenging. Yes. And you invest in it and you build yourself up. We talk about this idea that we're, we're recreating that intimacy of Moshe and God or the Kohen Gadol and God. And then we sing Mare Kohen and you should sing Mare Kohen. And then it just stops, right? It basically says, fortune is the eye that saw this. And now we're on page 572. But on 574, but the, our forefathers' iniquities destroyed the temple. And so there's this pro profound shift, an immediate 180, oh, the, the, the joy and the exhilaration. And then all of a sudden now here we are, we're, we're, we're not just here, right? We're also in the, in the destruction of the temple, right? And we, we actually then go back. We, we, you know, we haven't come back here just yet when we start to, which we will in a moment, but we go on that journey. We say, oh, actually we messed it up. And everything that we had, we no longer have. And so from 574 on begins another section, which is really hard for people, okay? I, I, I totally get it. I hear it. But it's basically like slichot, right? Essentially, we're starting slichot and we're mourning. And so from 574 up until 584, those 10 pages, is basically a recollection of all the things that we had and now it was all destroyed. From 584 and on, we are, have gone, gone into really the section of the first slichot. So you'll recognize that by that section of Zuchor Rachamecha, Hashem Echafadecha. So if you've been saying the slichot throughout Elul, which if you haven't started yet, it's a good time to start doing that. We dive at 6.30 in the morning. Everyone's welcome to join us. But you recognize Zuchor Rachamecha, Hashem Echafadecha. Uh, you can start saying that's already the language of the slichot. Alna, bottom of page 584. Alna, right? That's the language of the Slichop. And then we go into 586. And 586 begins a section which we could spend, you know, great detail discussing. And I brought some things, but I, I'm not even really going to uh, go into to any detail of this at all because it does, it, you know, it it deserves much more time than I can give it at this moment. But Ela Ezkara starts talking about the Asara Haruge Malchut, the 10 uh, martyrs. And these 10 martyrs, obviously, and I've spoken about this many times about how we say a very similar thing on Tisha B'Av, but we discuss here, we describe here the, um, these 10 great sages, all of whom died in, in terrible and cruel ways, and they're spread out over many centuries. So though it, it reads like this some sort of chronological affair, it is not, right? These, are, these sages are, are spread out throughout several centuries. 
Uh, but nonetheless, they all died, al-Kiddush Hashem, they were all killed for teaching Torah, for being rabbis, for being Jews, and each of them were remarkable in their own way. And yes, we could do an entire shir just looking at all these people and what they taught, and that would be a worthwhile thing to do, uh, but we don't really have the time for that. So what I recommend is, again, whereas normally in normal years, you might feel pretty like already pretty tired. So um, now you've, you, you maybe you'll have a bit more energy to be able to do this. You can be sitting on your couch, right, and just sit and read and, and understand a little bit and use the footnotes in the art scroll, Machsor. If you need to take a break, take a break. Go for a walk, come back and, and read more. Spend your day in the Machsor, okay? That's my, my recommendation. And, or get some other day, you know, appropriate uh, reading, right? This is not the day to, you know, to be finishing that John Grisham novel. I hope nobody's actually reading John Grisham. Uh, but, you know, hopefully we're reading more, more uh, you know, intelligent stuff. Oh, he's a great writer. Uh, but this is not that day, right? This is a day to read, right? Elizabeth's got the, the, the guide there. and I hope that's been helpful for people. Right, this is a day to read from that and to read from this book or to print out, you know, you can't go wrong with Rabbi Sachs and some articles that we've presented. I mean, there's so much out there, right? All you got to do is just look a little bit. Uh, but here, when we're talking about these 10 martyrs, spend time, think about it. And the idea here, one of the ideas is that the death of the righteous atone for the Jewish people, but it's not so simple and so neatly packaged. It's also that... Uh, as a result of our sins, terrible things have happened to us. So we sit in mourning. We recognize there's a purpose behind it. We don't, it's not just like on Tisha B'Av where it's just like, you know, just kind of numb mourning. Here there's some purpose that's supposed to kind of inspire us to say, okay, what are we going to do with it? Okay, that's the Asara Haruge Malhut. Um, again, in my notes here, I did speak, plan to speak about more of this and talk about the relationship with Yosef, but I'm not going to get into that at this moment here. Um, so if you're in the Masor, that's basically the, the, that'll take you toward the end because you start doing this uh, Asara Hoge Malchut, then you have 592. That, that basically finishes on 592. And you're up to Zahor Lanu Brit Avot Kasher Amarta, which once again is the traditional uh, sections of the um, of the Slichot, right? That takes us to Shema Kolen. You can say Shema Kolen on your own. There's no problem with saying Shema Kolen. That's on page 596 already. Sorry. Um, you know, 596, you can sing, you know, Vahavio Timo Har Kochi, the previous, you know, sing the slower version now, right? You don't only sing the, the happier version later, but you sing the slower version at this moment, and then you can say Shema Kolenu, and then we already move into, you know, Ki Anu Amecha, beautiful melody, talking about how, you know, one of the most rousing moments of, of, um, of Yom Kippur, of course, about how we're in the hands of God, and then we go into Vidoy. And so what we've done is essentially we kind of went all the way back, all the way back to the, after the sin of the golden calf. And then we started to mark, you know, make our way forward into the temple service and then make our way forward. Actually, no, then, then the temple was destroyed. And then during the time the temple was destroyed, all these great people were, were um, you know, were, were martyred. And then now we're moving back and we're into this present moment of, Asham Nu, Bagad Nu, and we look within, and we try to be present with ourselves. And even though this is the Chazan's repetition, there's no reason why you couldn't do, as I mentioned last week, you could do the Vidoy each time we do it, right? You don't have to, but I would certainly recommend after you've just done that whole journey of the Chazan's repetition, without the Chazan's repetition, go into the Vidoy and do it again. Right, do it again and try to approach it from a different, um, a different angle. Okay, and then it, it basically, from there, it continues and you basically finish, uh, I mean, you could finish on page 610 with the bracha. You don't say the bracha, okay, let's be very clear about that. So 610, that's kind of like that culmination of everything that we've just said, but then we say, Melech mochel v'solech l'avonoteinu v'lavonotam obeit Yisrael, right? You say that whole section, don't say with Hashem's name. 
you don't say Baruch Atah Yud Ke Yud Ke Vav Ke, but that's just kind of the, the conclusion there. And then at that point, you basically stop because you don't do the Hoda'a and you don't do the Birkat Kohanim. Okay. Um, so that's basically the Musaf service. Does anybody have any questions on that? Anything that needs to be clarified? So you're all good. Thumbs up if you're good. Elizabeth, you're, you're like, what's the, what's the uncertainty? So um, when we're doing the, uh, doing the other services during the day, we don't, do we need to do a, 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 the repetition? So you don't, you don't need to. You, so the, the repetition of the, it would, this would be relevant for, for Shacharit and Mincha, obviously, right? So Shacharit, there's not much, there, is, there are these PUT, right? There are these songs that, that appear in the Shacharit repetition. You could say those but you don't have to. Uh, and Mincha doesn't have any PU team in it. So I wouldn't say, you know, in Mincha, you basically, I'll talk about Mincha in a moment, actually. Um, but yeah, so Shaka, you don't need to. You could sing, sing some of the songs if you want to, but you don't really need to. So Elizabeth, was there something that, that needs a bit more clarity? On page 610, that first paragraph, you're saying not to say those last few lines where it says Baruch Atah. So, you I mean, you could, you, you could say Baruch Atah Hashem if you want, right? Like, oh, you okay. Just, you're just saying not to say Hashem's name properly. I wouldn't say Hashem's name. And you don't have to say that, that, that whole section either, right? You, you okay. don't have to. Um, but I would say just as kind of this, as a, as a culmination of the process, uh that you just went upon, you know, that you just went on the journey, if you will. So yeah. you could say that, but without Hashem's name. And, and so, of course, you're not doing, you're not saying the, um, the Kahanim's... Yeah, the, so then from, okay. from 610, from Ritze and on, you wouldn't, you, would, you wouldn't say that anymore. Not, not even Hayom or... Oh, you could sing Hayom. Yeah, you certainly could sing Hayom on page... Um, 22. 622 if you wanted to. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, any other questions? I just wish I could remember all the tunes. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you know, so again, that resource that we put out is pretty good. I mean, I, I think we could have done, you know, it needs, I would have done more takes if we had the time. Uh, it's a pretty good, and there's also other things out there, and I'm sure, you know, there might be re tunes that, you know, you want to, you want to hear. It's hard. It is hard. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we do have a couple of days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, Sunday. Just put, put the music on, you know, on, on just repeat and just be listening to it just to get the, you know, and just do your best, you know, just do the best. It's, it's, it's about the heart, right? It's not about the, the melodies yeah. per se. It's sad. I mean, the melodies are a big part of it. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally with you, uh, but just do the best that you can. That's all. Thank you. Now, for Mincha, okay, I see, I see it's quite late already. Um, my hope is that on Thursday night, as part of my Shabbat Shuvah Drasha, because I'm not going to be doing it in Shul, obviously, this year, um, I want to talk about Sefer Yonah a little bit. I want to talk about the Book of Yonah. So that's really the main part of the Mincha service is the Book of Yonah. So I'm not going to discuss that at this moment. I'm going to move on to Neila. We'll come, you know, so we'll talk about Yonah Thursday night, but I'm going to move on to Neila. Okay. Same thing with, with um, so I just mentioned before I do that. So with Minra, you just dive in the regular Amida. So that is on um, page 650. So you would start with Ashray, um, and then you could, you could read the Torah reading, right? That's in the, in the book here on uh, page 630. 
And then after you do the Torah reading, then read uh, Sefer Yona. And again, we'll go into more detail on Sefer Yona on Thursday if you join me. And then on page 650, we start the Amidah. And that, again, you just say, say it straight like you would normally on your own. And that finishes after the Vidoy that finishes on page 664. Then on 666, you have the repetition of the Shaliyah Tzibor, which, um, again, if you wanted to do the Vidoy again, if it would be meaningful for you to do the Vidoy one more time after you've just done it, you could do it then, but you don't necessarily need to do it at that moment. And you finish Mincha with, one second, with Avinu Malkenu on page 700, which you should say. Okay. After Avinu Malkenu, then we jump into Ni'ila. Now, Ni'ila is going to be the hardest it, to an extent because it's such a, it's really about community at that time. And it's really about everyone coming together in that, that final moment. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard, but we just do the best that we can, as I, as I said. And it really all just comes down to this idea of ni'ila is the idea of, of the gate is closing, this gate of opportunity. And so we try to feel, okay, you know, if I haven't really done it just yet, now is the opportunity to, to just, just do it, just make it happen. The ni'ila starts with, ash, with um, ashray and uvalatzion, and then we start our private Amida, which continues and then finishes, I'm sorry, I'm just going, finishes on page 724. Once we have done our private Amida, then I would pick it up from page 736, okay? So 736 is the beginning of Slichot. And this, of course, yes, it needs to be said with a community and needs to be, you know, screamed at the top of your lungs. But we we'll try to tap in a little bit to that, to that space of, of, of what this moment is all about. So we start with, on 736, Slichot, In the morning, when we do Slichot, we don't say, the Yud Gimel Midot of Rachamim. We skip over those sections because we're not davening with a minion. However, I would recommend that you do say it at Kol Nidre and also at Ni'ila here, right? So Kol Nidre the night before, and here you can say it. Um, you can either say it, like as one suggestion is to say it in the trup with the, with the as I mentioned last week, with the... Um, the can't the cantillation Hashem Hashem Kel Rachu Vechanun. So if you know that, great. If not, you can sing it in the normal thing. Just mean it, right? Uh, so re I I think a person can sing it at Neila. They sh they should. Even though again it's Slichot tomorrow morning, we won't be saying it. But I think because of the importance of that moment for all of us, you can you know Hashem Hashem say it with Hashem's name. Right, you can say the full the full expression of it, and sing it and mean it. And if there's one thing, right, there's there's so much that we can um, say. And as I as I mentioned in our first exploration of this, when we spoke about slichot of the thirteen midot of compassion, each of them can be opened up and explored. And, and right, but the the, the the main thing, all we have to do is just try to appeal to God's love. The 13 attributes of compassion are the idea that God deep, deeply loves us, right? Rachamim is a, is a rechem, is a womb. We imagine God to be surrounding us, God to be enveloping us with love. And so as you say them, just try to appeal to Hashem's love. And it's not just appeal to, I don't, you know, feel Hashem's love. It's not something you need to appeal to. It's something that's within you. It's something that, that is accessible to you. And 
you know, go through this process. I'll try to, I'm going to give people times in which, you know, we can suggest it is good, even if we're not going to be davening together, we should in theory be davening at the same time. But go through that process, do each thing build up. It's this kind of like this crescendo, these waves that build up, right? Kale, Melech, Yoshe, we know that feeling, try to say with as much feeling, try to say with as much expression, take the time to say, okay, what am I saying? What does this mean? And build yourself up. And over and over and over again, as much as you can, try to sense Hashem's love that surrounds you and that envelops you as much as you can. And that's, that's Ni'ila. I mean, with all these things, it's 917, um, you know, and so it's, it's, it is quite late, but, you know, we should, we could have a shear just on Ni'ila, but it's just in that moment, feel what you can, feel Hashem's love, feel surrounded by Hashem's love, try to, to let down whatever walls, barriers that we build up to feeling and to experiencing and try to just tap into the deep and powerful energy that is available to us in Ni'ila. You would, I would continue all of Ni'ila, keep, say the whole thing up to page 754. Similar to what we did with Mustaf, we would then as well finish with that paragraph of Elokeinu Belokei Avoteinu Mechal La'avonoteinu Bayom HaKippurim Hazeh. And just like we did with Musaf, you could say Baruch Atah Hashem Melech Mochel V'Soleach, right? So you could, you know, you're not, since we're not saying God's name there, but we could appeal to Hashem in that situation. From Ritzay and on, we wouldn't do anything, okay? So we would skip Ritzay, and we would jump to Avinu Malkeinu, on page 758. And once again, take your time to say it with as much meaning and as much purpose and as much focus and looking at the English and then moving back to the Hebrew and really, you know, spacing it out and doing the best that you can with it. And of course, 762 with the, the, the great climax. Just, you know, do what you can. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I feel silly saying it, you know, like, and I hope, but just like, you can do this, right? You can have those moments where you just look in and you look within yourself and you find that, that, that intense hyper-focus and say Shema and say Baruch Shem Kavod Malchut three times and say Hashem Huelokim seven times and try to build an intensity with each one as you say it and you know, if you're with family, it's sometimes it's hard to be able to tap into these spaces in front of children. Sometimes it's easy. I don't know. But really try to give your, put yourself into that moment as much as you can. And that's the conclusion. You say then, L'shana haba b'yerushalayim, the shofar, we are going to blow the shofar communally about 10 minutes after Yom Kippur. So you don't need a shofar in order to finish Yom Kippur. If you don't hear the shofar, the fast will still finish for you. So don't worry about that. But everyone should jump online after you daven Mariv. And after it's especially important in Mariv that you add in on page 776, you add in Havdalah, which is already put there in the text for you, not in a shaded box. But there's a section in the bracha of atachonein le'adam dat umelamed le'enosh bina, it then starts saying atachonan tanu lemada toratecha. That's havdala. That's actually the first time that we say havdala. So when you say that havdala, that then allows us to then do malacha after Shabbat. After you say that, get your um, your cup ready of you know your cup of wine or grape juice or whatever it is that you that you you know that you use after a fast. And then join us online for Havdalah, for the shofar, and for, a, you know, a bit of singing and a l'chaim. And that, that'll basically bring us to the, to the end of the Yom Kippur experience. So, any questions or comments, things that I didn't touch upon that need a bit of clarity? Again, Thursday, we'll uh, try to go a little bit deeper into Yonah to give us a bit more insight. But any, any questions in the meantime? Okay. 
So, yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. When did you say you're doing the Shabbos Shuva? Uh, Thur Thursday night. Uh, it is about Yona and I can Yeah, you know, most likely. <laughs> I'm glad at least some of you are smiling. That's great. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, the idea is to, to look at the idea of teshuva. What is, I mean, Yonah's weird. I mean, it's a weird book. <laughs> it's a crazy book. Uh, like, what does it have to do with anything? So we'll talk about that. Um, that's Thursday night. So just to sum up, you can do this. It's within your ability. It's going to be different. It's going to be weird, but it also will hopefully be a beautiful opportunity of, of reflection, meditation, and personal growth. Uh, and, you know, I bless you that it's so amazing that, that you like think about coming back to Shul next year, but like, actually, no, nah, maybe I'm going to stay home. But then, of course, you'll come back next year because you'll forget about it. Um, but yes, I bless you with a really incredible opportunity uh, and see this as an opportunity for, for self-knowledge and self-growth. And Hashem should bless all of us. He should hear our prayers and accept our prayers and forgive us and usher in that time, the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, next year in Yerushalayim. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night for the Art of Prayer, the finale, and Thursday night, of course, for the Shabbat Shuva Drasha. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Pleasure. All Thank you. Take Thank care. You very much. Last well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take ah. care.